from before time began with the very foundation of the universe we find the reign of God over all creating all supervising all superintending all sustaining all he is the king and his kingdom reigns forever it's an eternal kingdom we don't bring the kingdom it exists we might define the reign of the kingdom of god his kingdom is his reign his rule over creation and humanity we might define it as an action dynamic the kingdom of god brings redemption of humanity and restoration of creation we find in genesis chapter 1 to 3 and 4 all of the great philosophies all of the great philosophical questions and the answers to them and these lead into the theme of the kingdom of god which developed in the uh reign of king david as the king um and became the central focus of jesus teaching he came preaching good news of a kingdom so when he says he came to preach the kingdom of god what did people understand it says that he came to preach good news of a kingdom to the poor to set at liberty the oppressed to declare the year of jubilee so he came declaring good news good news of a jubilee where justice is brought across a land where reconciliation occurs where equality of people and economic redistribution occurs so this evangelism this proclamation this declaration is a declaration of liberation it's a declaration of uh reconciliation and cultural healing there's an advocacy there on behalf of the poor and community development is integral in what we are discussing so let us look at this kingdom in genesis chapter 1 to 3 begins in the beginning god that's a statement of kingship isn't it In the beginning god created whatever you create your own so it's a statement of ownership and it's of ruling over what what we have created the response to the kingship is what we call discipleship the human response to god's reign is what we call discipleship and we can call the first response is spiritual disciple our spiritual life responds to god's spirit and his life and then we come to the first commandment which is that we are to manage the earth with a rule on his behalf as managers of the earth and so we're to manage the created order and we might call that economic discipleship that manage means ruling it means uh superintending it means uh, caring for protecting then we come to Cain and Cain slaying Abel and then then God coming down and speaking to to Cain and asking where is his brother and his reply is am i my brother's keeper and god does not answer that question it echoes across the universe it echoes across the earth it echoes across history the answer is obvious in all of our hearts and minds whatever our religion we are our brother's keeper and our relationship to each other as human beings is not the same as the economic relationship which is a vertical relationship of authority and control our relationship to each other is that of equality and so we are to live in brotherhood and sisterhood with each other to live with justice in our relationship with each other 
So this we can talk about as social discipleship. And that combination of all of these leads us also to a political discipleship and in the economic sphere to an environmental discipleship. So we can say that the kingdom is God's rule, bringing redemption of humanity and restoration of creation. Now that kingdom, its principles have not changed. Its manifestation is different in each epoch in world history and in biblical history. In the Old Testament, the king intervenes at various points in the lives of Adam, and Abraham, of Noah, of David and Moses, the, the prophets. He comes down, we see these epiphanies of God, where he comes and he speaks to people. We see him intervening in the battles. We see him intervening in the national history. and in the international history, we see his purposes being fulfilled. But he doesn't dwell among men. That uh, intervention, those interventions, we see illustrated the economic principles, the social principles, the political principles. But the dwelling of man, God among men, that is the seed of the new covenant. That is the incarnation and then the coming of the Holy Spirit. So between the incarnation, the cross, the resurrection and Pentecost, there is a dramatic change in the relationship of God and human beings. Now he dwells in us, his followers, his disciples and his kingdom and its principles socially, economically, environmentally, politically, these principles are outworked in communities of the king, which often are churches, but can also be other Christian organizations, such as a Christian university or non-profit organization. And so we find the principles taught in the New Testament as they were in the Old Testament and then we come to the last days and the coming back of the king, the return of the king as a triumphal king, reigning over the earth, judging those who have opposed him, uplifting the poor and creating a reign on earth of justice, of equality, of prosperity. So our time now is a time looking forward. The kingdom is present, but it's not yet fully fulfilled. We have signs and wonders. These are signs of the future. But in that day, the power of God will be fulfilled. We will see clearly. We will know his empowerment. Our bodies will be totally different. Um, so we look forward to that day. We experience today some degree of healing, some degree of signs and wonders, but incomplete. Some answers to prayer, but incomplete. Looking forward to that future hope. And it creates an alternative to the kingdoms of this earth. But there will come a day when the king comes again, and this time not on a donkey, but on a, on, a, on a horse, on a charging horse, on a white horse, coming in as ruler, coming in as king. And as he enters, he will destroy that which is evil and those who have been evil. He will judge. He comes as judge of the earth. And his kingdom will rule the kingdoms of the earth. It says for a thousand years, which is a code word for a, a long time. We don't know how long he will rule. And eventually, after he's ruled on earth, then there will become a new heavens and a new earth. And his reign will continue. Uh, and so we look forward with hope to that coming kingdom. Because as we suffer on earth, often... Our hope is damaged and destroyed. We seek to bring his kingdom, but we often are blocked because it's a kingdom present, but it's a kingdom not yet. It's not yet fulfilled. So we look with hope 
at times here we experience the power of God, but it's not complete. But on that day, when we see him, it will be complete. Sometimes we, we see things in people and then we will see people clearly. Sometimes we have words about people and then we will know. Um, sometimes we pray for healing. For Go on then. This return of the king is prophesied in Daniel. It's portrayed in Revelation 17 to 21. Now these prophecies in Revelations particularly are applied to Rome. The book was written through the church under Roman dominion. So there's a first level. And often when you're interpreting prophecy, there's a, there's a logical level for the situation of the time. And underneath there's a prophecy about the future. And so in Revelations, we're aware that he's speaking both of Rome and he's speaking of a world empire, uh, a final city, a final conflict between this world empire and its city. And there's a city of God versus this global city conflict. And Babylon is the symbol of both Rome and the symbol of this final city. And that final city will be one that rules over the nation. So it's international and it rules. Purple and scarlet is a symbol of its rulership, the cup that it holds. Um, it's a center of opulence, this city. It's full of precious stones, of merchants, of goods. And within it, the blood of the saints flows. So we expect in the end times that our blood will be flowing. It's exploitative, it's oppressive. It draws in the wealth of the nations. It's full of sensuality. It's ruled by one man of spiritual authority. It has a religion, and that religion is against Christians. So home for demons is destroyed by plague and fire. So eventually that city of man, that Babylon, which I understand to be a global urban culture, but some would say it's going to be a specific city in a specific place. Some think particularly in Babylon itself. Um, uh, others say, well, there was Rome, so it's going to be Rome again. Um, and certainly in the Reformation, uh, everybody considered the Roman church as part of that whole process. Uh, we don't quite know, but we know that towards the end times, the city will rise up and there will be this final conflict. Um, But as that happens, the prophecy in Daniel, the ancient of days took his seat. The son of man coming with the clouds was given authority and an everlasting kingdom was set up. This time he comes as a horse, on a horse as a general, he comes bringing justice with a sword. Um, and in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, it says, we will rise up to meet him and to bring him back into the city as a triumphant king. So we've got this uh, phrase in here, like the Roman general coming into Rome and the people went out to meet him and they bring him back as a triumphant king to the city. So we will go out to meet Christ and bring him onto the earth where he will reign on the earth. Um, for those who've grown up with a, um, dispensational view, there's nothing in there about being raptured. Simply we go out to meet him and bring him back on earth. We will reign with him. And elsewhere it says that if we build well our works of gold and silver and precious stones, they will survive. And so if we build in the cities, I wonder if our works in the cities will survive. I don't know. But it's motivating to think that they might. But whatever is gold will not be wasted. It says he's coming soon. It says that the gospel will get to the ends of the earth. Well, it's nearly at the ends of the earth, Matthew 24, 14, and then he will come. There are prophecies about the Jews being back in Israel. That's occurred in 1948. So then he will come. So we, since we're in the end times, we sense we're waiting for that kingdom. Okay, so the traditional gospel of salvation speaks very much of this coming kingdom. 
and um, speaks of conversion and discipleship. And so we proclaim the gospel of salvation. People get converted and they come into the churches. And so then those people in the churches move on to heaven. So the mission is focused on the lost. And for much of the world, that is, that is the gospel. Uh, so the gospel is one that's focused on heaven and this coming kingdom of Christ. And we want to be redeemed for that. So conversion is necessary and then discipleship, very important. And so uh, mission is about proclamation of that gospel. And the result of people being saved is they come into churches and people from those churches will end up in heaven. So mission is to the lost. Now, that's the gospel of salvation. And often when I'm with pastors, I ask them, is your gospel a gospel of salvation or a gospel of the kingdom? And it's kind of confusing for pastors. So then I, I go to this next slide, which you can understand perfectly, right? Um, okay. Um, the gospel of the kingdom focuses on the king and his reign. He reigns. Um, and his reign we experience when we receive the Holy Spirit. So again, conversion is central to coming under the reign of Christ. When we acknowledge his reign, then the Holy Spirit comes in our life. Um, and then that kingdom is manifest in kingdom communities, which might be the church, but it might be a nonprofit, it might be uh, the many different organizations. I spoke of APU before. Um, so our gospel is the good news that the king has come and he is in the present and in the future. He is reigning and he wants to bring transformation of the present and in the future, he wants to bring a full redemption of mankind. And he wants to restore creation. It's not just the spirit he's interested in. He's interested in our social lives. He's interested in the restoration of creation. Um, and similarly, the church is involved in the community and in the uh, life of the economic life of the world. It's engaged because that's the reign of God that he wants to bring. So our gospel is not just to the lost, it's also to the poor and the outcast and the needy. It's not just to the sinful, it's to those who are suffering. Um, and the gospel then meets whatever of those needs it is. Is it sin that we're dealing with? It is it suffering? Is it poverty? The gospel then deals with those issues and it makes sense to people because it's a gospel about a kingdom, not just a gospel about salvation. Hard to speak about salvation to someone who's starving. You just need food. And in the giving of food, they'll understand about the Lord. So kingdom mission then has socioeconomic implications in the scriptures. And we can look at some in Jesus' teaching. He talks about light and salt. He spoke of being a suffering servant. He gave a prophetic critique of leaders. In Israel, he fed the hungry, he clothed the naked, he healed the sick. And there's deliverance from demons, which sets people free. These are all social, economic um, dynamics in his teaching. I could add in here the teaching we did on the, the economics, kingdom economics. Um, so gospel of salvation is very important because salvation is the entrance to the kingdom. It's simple, it's easy to communicate. It's easy to get people to teach them how to communicate the gospel. Um, but it's reductionist and it excludes people. Whereas the gospel of the kingdom includes people because people can start coming under his authority in maybe the economic sphere or maybe in because you're dealing with HIV AIDS and so they see that you're helping them so they respond 
to that care and they respond to the Lord, even though they don't know who he is. They're beginning to respond so that the gospel of the kingdom draws people in inclusively. Um, the gospel of the kingdom is comprehensive. It can be communicated in many contexts. It opens up freedom to reproduce. It gives me a basis of meaning in multiple areas. I've been teaching this for years, and it takes a lot of time for our thinking to change. Like years. Like years. It, um, which is okay. Um, we can go into the signs of the kingdom, but do you have thoughts on the gospel of salvation, the gospel of the kingdom? I guess my question would be, I mean, you mentioned that it takes years to shift the thinking. Said so the, the church that I grew up in, I would say, was, was very much in line with the fundamentalist idea. And, you know, I think most of the folks there are just given up on, like, in terms of the world, it's like it's a done deal, right? Like, it's, it's awful. It's not getting any better. Um, definitely, we're... You know, like, yeah, I mean, I think they fell in line with the we'll all get raptured out before things get too bad. And and really that idea of tarrying was was a very real thing. Right. So you have especially with the older women in the church who just every day they prayed that the Lord would come back tomorrow and believed that, you know, this idea of, of the second coming being any literally any day now. Um, and so. Like it's just hard for me to 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 wrap my head around how like it's worked like it hasn't worked but it has worked yeah. for that congregation right like they've been steeped in those ideas for generations mm -hmm. and so even though really the kingdom gospel would speak more life to them probably because pretty much everybody in that church is poor and has always been poor you know like there's there's some good news that I feel like we miss out on because it like I I think in some ways they probably um they would um uh my words are gone because it's late but they would um connect with the idea of being in exile right like they feel like we're all in exile just you know we're we are the the left behind here and and just hanging on until the Lord comes back. Um, and so it just doesn't seem like there's a lot of motivation to, you know, to push into to kingdom principles while we're here, short of you need to, you need to get saved, you know. Yeah, and there is a positive piece in there, which is this, yeah. this, this closed box of ideas has protected them and kept them. And given them hope and stability and identity mm -hmm. in a in a difficult world to live in um, and so the withdrawal of fundamentalists and evangelicals is a is a coping mechanism that sociologically is quite significant um, so that's that's positive okay. yeah but if someone had have taught perhaps uh, kingdom economic principles, would they be in a different place economically? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a good possibility. It's it's funny because I find that in in the church I grew up in, like I think that there's a deeper because everybody's struggling so much, right? There's a very deep spirituality, and a lot of probably the practices that sustain me the most in in my faith came from that church more so than than my current one right like I, so it's like they've and they've got the the upper hand on so many parts of the spiritual walk compared to your your you know everyday evangelical <laughs> church you know but then there's just these these big pieces it's i and i guess that's why churches need each other right because each each church has has a variety of strengths but um yeah That's true. The depth of commitment to the word and to prayer and um, the holiness yeah. that's, that's required. That's, these are really significant 
mm -hmm. foundations for us. And uh, those who are more engaged tend to miss on these things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, hence don't have necessarily the, the spiritual strength, the pietistic strength to, to cope with engagement. Yeah. Well, let me go on. All right, so throwing that in there, it'll take a while for you to think. Uh, there are signs of the kingdom in the, the New Testament. Uh, so the kingdom is yet to come. Uh, so, so Jesus says, well, look, these, some of these things are signs of the future. Um, and so the ones we, we know particularly are miracles of healing and control over nature. So they're not complete. So often we're praying for someone, we don't get healed. But sometimes we see the Lord heal. So they're signs. Um, sometimes people think we've got to pray for people and everybody will get healed and they're disappointed because people don't get healed if they lose their faith. If they understand, no, this is a sign of his coming. He's not fully here in his presence and power, but at times he brings his power through. And particularly when we are preaching in contexts where there are non-Christians, evangelistically, then he will show up in power and there will be signs and wonders. So on the edges of the kingdom advances, there are these confrontations and signs and wonders. Um, there's a miracle of conversion and a new birth. And when you see people come to know the Lord, you see the transformation that occurs. Um, there's the fruit of the Spirit in the lives of Christians. As people grow, you watch the beauty of, of them. Um, some of the signs of kingdom are in suffering. That's a tricky one. <laughs> How can suffering be a sign of the kingdom? Huh? Um, so let me, partly in answer to my you know, question before, um, the Lausanne Congress, the Lausanne, Lausanne movement began really 1974. Billy Graham called evangelists from all around the world to Lausanne in Switzerland, 5,000. And during the Lausanne Congress, John Stott, the leader of the evangelicals uh, in the Anglican Communion in England, drafted the Lausanne Covenant which integrated these themes of the, the proclamation of the word, the uh, sign and the deed, the actions in terms of social justice, it broke down the wall between evangelism and social justice. And this was extended further at the Lausanne Congress II in Manila in 1989. So word, deed and signs need to go together. So fundamentalists are strong on the word, Evangelicals get the word and they're also strong on doing stuff and deed, social work, community development. Pentecostals are strong on the sign. But you put these three together, you get a strong consensus of how the kingdom advances. Um, so Leslie Newbegin, who's a fairly famous uh, theologian uh, from the liberal wing of the church, she speaks of the kingdom as being universal. And it restores physical bodies, it restores relationships with others and with God. Uh, these are universal things. Um, it deals with structural issues. So here's a, an extension of, so what, what the churches that came from the poor, it's difficult for them to think about changing the structures. So the Presbyterians and Anglicans, they think in those terms. Um, that the kingdom doesn't just modify structures, it goes to the very roots of the structures. So Jesus didn't try and change structures. So people say he didn't change structures, therefore we don't need to. But Jesus got, went a lot deeper and he went to the principles. He was only teaching for three years, so he didn't have time to change the structures. It takes 30 years, 40 years, 50 years to change a structure, or maybe 2000 years. And that's what he was after. And so the kingdom goes very deep. The kingdom is definitive. It's God's final will. And when everything else is gone, the kingdom will, will remain. So it's a great thing. Now, 
another question in here is the kingdom of the church so what do you think is the church the same as the kingdom I'd say that's a big fat no. <laughs> I mean, I think the church is supposed to reflect the kingdom, but I don't. I think it'd be a, quite a stretch to ever try to argue that the church would be the the like the total fulfillment of the kingdom. I don't know that we could ever get there. Um, and the church, you know, it's it's just too prone to to problems <laughs> um, to be considered the kingdom would be my my take on that catholic church equates the kingdom with the church on the kingdom on earth is the church the catholic church no. i think it's a nice idea if we could get there it'd be a great thing right but i think the church should be a great reflection of the kingdom but good grief for as many people who have been hurt by the church and you know the church as a whole right any given number of them that if that's what we're putting out there we're you know we're shooting ourselves in the foot to say that that the church is the kingdom <laughs> maybe your um your broader sense of we all are the church right so like um as believers we should be representing the kingdom well like you might be able to make that a that you know that um your line of thinking but yeah it feels tricky So we're very damaged and collectively we're very damaged and if we put all the christians together around the world we're kind of a pretty sinful lot and not a very good reflection of the lord um, his kingdom is much bigger than us he reigns over all not just the church his principles are universal um, and they affect all parts of economics and politics and countries and internationally and the word basilia translated kingdom occurs 162 times um, on the other hand the word ecclesia which is what we translate the church occurs 115 times uh, 36 of those are in the plural and 79 in the singular all rendered church or assembly in acts chapter 19 um so there's quite a difference between these two themes within the scriptures itself when it speaks of the kingdom it doesn't speak of the church they're two separate ideas in the scriptures but the people of the church they are the heirs of the kingdom the kingdom belongs to us they gave to peter the keys to the kingdom um, so the kingdom is ours now you got different views here so um your different stages in your thinking let's see calvin viewed the kingdom as ruling therefore the church should rule all right so calvin was in the city of geneva in switzerland he was their he was their pastor there was fourteen thousand people in the city he ruled the city he ruled the city council because he said the church rules. This is like, a bit like ISIS trying to rule with Islam. It's very Catholic, it's very Presbyterian in its position. It's one position. Luther saw the church and the state as two different things that work alongside each other. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of earth are in parallel, and there's always this conflict between them. And so Anglican and Episcopalian churches, Lutheran churches, they they have this kind of theology of the tension between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of, of the earth and how we how we work with it. The Anabaptists, the Free Churches, Pentecostals, they view the church in opposition to the rulers of the earth. Uh, so we're in constant warfare with that, whereas Luther, we're in tension. Sometimes we're at war, sometimes we work with um so each of these these churches has different theologies and that's that's helpful for us we can use different theologies depending on where we find ourselves in the social structure 
So if you're discipling someone who was born into the elite, you probably want to teach them Presbyterian theology. If you're working with poor people, then you work with the theologies of Pentecostalism or Baptist theologies because that these theologies work at those, those levels. So Mara, what you're doing is transitioning. You do a master's degree, you're becoming pretty educated. Um, you're transitioning your status in society. Um, as are many of your generation and your your friends. So it's it's reasonable that you're going through a phase change as to how you do theology and a broadening of that. Now there's another set of things in here. When you hear of the social gospel, that for evangelicals was a no-no. And I've got up on my bookcase here behind me, I don't know if you can see my bookcase, I've got these old books from the 1800s and 1600s. And one of them was by Rauschenbusch in 1907. And um, he, he, he wrote, I've got one here, The Social Principles of Jesus. So he said that the kingdom is the highest good. Um, the idea of God is the highest and most comprehensive conception and the philosophy, the idea of the kingdom of God is the highest and broadest idea in sociology and ethics. Um, and so he created a social structure based on the reign of God. He converted it into a set of social and political principles. And then the liberal churches tried to implement those social and political principles through the political systems of America and then out globally. And this came into the World Council of Churches and the evangelicals rejected it. And that's why we set up the Lausanne movement and then the World Evangelical Alliance in opposition to the World Council of Churches. And this is the dividing point. And so the reading Russian Bush, it's beautiful, almost some of the most beautiful thing you could ever read. But his mistake was to convert the idea of the kingdom of God into a political structure and social structuring. Um, that's not there in the scriptures. It can be something we can derive from the theme of the kingdom of God, but it's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not a political party or political structure. Parables of the kingdom, lots of them. Jesus loved to teach these parables. The kingdom of heaven. Now you've got the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of heaven, what's the difference? Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all right? Matthew, he's writing to Jews, and Jews can't use the word God. So he uses the kingdom of heaven. John, he's writing to Greeks, so he uses the word God. So it's the kingdom of God. That's, that's the difference. It's the same thing. Why can't Jews use the word God? Uh, because it was too holy to use. So the word Yahweh. They, okay. They, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Okay. They never pronounce it. That's why nobody knows how to pronounce it. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> um, so even the manuscripts is just missing, you know. It's, uh, so it's the same thing. So the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. Uh, it's like a mustard seed that grows and it spans everywhere. It's like yeast that changes and transforms society. It's like treasure hidden in the field. So you sell everything else to buy that field. It's like a net let down in a lake. Um, the kingdom provides for birds and grass and for you. Um, so with these parables, he gives all sorts of characteristics of the kingdom. And these are good images that we can use. Commercial images, the treasure, the pearl, the sharing wealth, reward for faithfulness, mercy, and agricultural uh, images. So number one, I'm just going through images of the kingdom here. It's like sowing seeds. And there's wheat and weeds that grow up inside the church. So should you pull out the weeds? And Jesus says, no, don't let them grow. They'll, they'll die by themselves. Uh, 
because if you pulled it out, you might destroy the wheat. Um, he speaks of the kingdom in terms of having faith like a child in order to enter the kingdom. Um, so many images that are there about the kingdom. So it's a rich treasure trove for us to teach. And then we have the conflict of the kingdom with evil, with evil people, with the culture, with evil structures. So in the Lord's Prayer, he says, deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. So his reign is of such greatness that it's always in conflict with the evil powers of principalities, of, of rulers, of governments. And so we're always in attention because we're in the kingdom and it's in tension with these other ruling dynamics. So that's a very brief introduction to the great theme of the kingdom of God. And I'll put some books here. Um, and there's two or three of these. Um, you've got Bill Dernis's book, I think, online. And Glasser, I've got in there. Um, so you've got some of that. And George Eldon Ladd. Gospel of the Kingdom, that would be, uh, he's got two or three books on the kingdom, but his work is quite definitive in terms of theologies. And I mentioned Rauschenbusch um, and Howard Snyder, The Kingdom Manifesto. I think I've got that in one of your course readings somewhere. Um, that little book that he summarizes so beautifully, uh, What is the Kingdom? Okay. So now your task is to go and preach this kingdom of God. Right. Now he says preach because your first task is to announce it. Whatever you do, you're doing it in the name of Jesus. You're announcing it as you go. And then as you're going, you're bringing the kingdom. So whatever needs you're engaging with, you're bringing a kingdom response. So as you bring the response, you speak in the name of Christ. Doesn't mean you ram the gospel down people's throat and speak in the name of Christ and offering them whatever service it is that you're serving. So you're bringing the kingdom. And you're not just bringing it in terms of mercy, but where there's injustice, you're bringing the righteousness of the kingdom. And so that leads you into conflict with unrighteousness. Um, and you're bringing the kingdom in such a way that it transforms structures and nations. Uh, because while it is not structural and yet it creates structure wherever it goes. It creates structure by transforming what is. It keeps changing. And sometimes it overthrows structure, but generally it transforms from the inside. And that's the way salt transforms. <laughs>